Hi. I had an extra day off work, so I thought I'd make another video. So that's two in one week. It's unprecedented. Uh, so obviously, I'll show you the, the Pentax 67. And uh, I'll tell you why I got it, of course, and show you how everything sounds and feels. So I got this way back when I was in community college. I got a lot of community, I got a lot of cameras back then. And uh, I got this for a portrait photography class. Uh, and let's see, uh, after that, I decided to use it for more general photography. And uh, it's been a really good portrait camera. And uh, I sort of want to do more landscape photography in the future. So I'll probably get a couple wider lenses. And uh, I just got like um, uh, ND grad filter uh, holders. So that'll be new. And I'll tell you what it's like to use for landscapes and things like that. But this is supposed to be, uh, you know, also a really good landscape camera. So, so uh, if you want to do portraits or landscapes, uh, then you should uh, have this on your shopping list. Uh, and the as for the feel of the camera, it's uh, really well made. It's very rugged, um, just because it's. Uh, designed basically the same as a 35 millimeter SLR camera. It's um, like really sturdy. You don't need to worry about uh, waist level finders, dust and water getting into the viewfinder. And it's also, um, it's also really like uh, oh, way, way overbuilt and everything like that. Uh, there's not really any problems with uh, any mechanism inside the camera. It's not really known for breaking down in any, any particular way. So if you want a really rugged, durable camera, uh, this is uh, one of the best ones out there. Uh, the, the one exception might be in, that in the future it might get hard to repair the shutter because it's electronic. So that's something I've been more concerned about lately. Um, I think uh, I think maybe the 2020s are, are, is when there's going to be some sort of shakeout in the film camera world where the cameras that are repairable will go up in price and then we'll find out what they are. And then the cameras that are no longer repairable will like plummet in, in value. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen with the Pentax uh, 67 because there are a whole lot of them out there and it shouldn't be too hard to get parts bodies, but the prices sort of, you know, doubled uh, in the last few years. Uh, so I'm not sure how practical and affordable it will be. Uh, there's always the hope that, you know, maybe people will be able to reverse engineer pieces and manufacture replacement uh, parts. But that would need a whole lot of like legal wrangling, I think, that might make it too expensive or something like that. Um, so uh, getting something with a mechanical shutter might be the way to go. Uh, I think, let me think. Uh, man, when I got this, it was maybe eight years ago, you could get one that was practically, like you could get a body that was practically brand new for $400. And now it's basically like seven, eight hundred dollars for a really minty body. So I think I saw one that sold for like a thousand dollars a while back. 
So maybe getting a beat up second body that uh, still has working shutter is a good idea. So you should be able to find one of those for maybe two, three hundred dollars, I think. Um, so uh, just as an insurance policy, uh, try to consider the future repairability of uh, any camera you get. But anyway, as far as the feel of the camera, uh, the, the, the size and weight, of course, uh, it's really, really big. Um, it's not as big as I thought it was because people really played up the size on the internet before I got it. And then when I first took it out of the box, I thought, oh, this isn't super big. Uh, but uh, after the, that in initial impression wore off, yeah, this is really pretty big. <laughs> uh, but your, 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 your feelings might be a little different compared to where you're coming from. Uh, if you're starting out with 35 millimeter uh, SLR, this will seem really big. But if you're coming from, you know, the uh, medium format, which is more common nowadays because people want to buy something that's more comparable in image quality to digital SLRs. Um, if you started out with a medium format camera, then, you know, this might not seem super big. Uh, like I said, like I was saying, the overall feel is super rugged and durable. Um, no one's ever going to uh, really say that it feels cheap or, or anything like that. Uh, and um, it's pretty darn heavy. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll definitely want one of the thicker shoulder pads, shoulder straps with a pad on it. Um, or uh, keep this in a shoulder bag or a backpack. And uh, there's no grip, which sort of uh, was improved upon in this 67.2 model. So you could grip it like that. But just like with the, the, the Fuji GW693 and uh, the GS645, if you put your fingers to, to the bottom of the camera, then your fingers wrap around pretty well and it's not, um, it's not uncomfortable to hold. It's just heavy. <laughs> uh, I don't have the wooden grip to, to put on the left side, which I kind of want to get just because it makes it so much easier to support the camera when you're in uh, vertical orientation. Uh, but uh, I just haven't gotten it yet. Um, Next up, I'll show you the shutter real quick. Uh, the interlock switch is really firm and sturdy. Uh, it's not the, the sort of ridges right here are a little bit hard to get to if you have gloves on. So you sort of have to use your fingernail to uh, flip it back and forth. To, well, to pull it in and then you push it with your fingertip. Uh, it's a little bit maybe hard to get to because of this button right here, this little thingy in the way. So anyway, uh, as far as the, the, the feel of the shutter button is, it's really smooth and there's like a, a, a squishy first stage where uh, you feel the springiness and then uh, you like have to squeeze a little bit harder for the rest of it. The shutter is really loud. It's definitely one of the loudest shutters in, a, in the medium format camera, aside from like the Bronica S2 or uh, one, of, one of the uh, um, one, one of the other older Bronicas. But it's uh, the vibration is mostly uh, like 
after the exposure. So there are only a few shutter speeds uh, that will cause uh, shutter vibration when you're using a telephoto lens, like a 300 millimeter lens. I think it was uh, one thirtieth of a second down to two seconds or something like that. Uh, the late Michael Reichman, he did a test. I'll link to that in the, sh in the show notes. But yeah, the, the shutter's really loud and it, uh, if you're shooting a person, uh, it'll let them know when to change poses or something like that. Just, just super loud, but satisfying shutter sound. Uh, let's see, so the fill advanced lever, it's really smooth and firm. Uh, takes quite a bit of force to bring it up, but it's pretty comfortable and uh, has a nice, very precise feel to it. Not a lot of wiggle up and down, and it has a comfortable standoff point too. So you can pull it out like that, about mount, and then you can hook your finger underneath. Um, the viewfinder, I find, it doesn't have enough eye relief for me, and I bought the 672 version because someone on the internet wrote that it had a, a lower magnification and you could like see the the whole frame if you if you wore glasses. Turns out that's not true at all. It's the exact same magnification, exact same eye relief. Uh, I still have to move my eye around to see all the edges with glasses on. Uh, so I was trying to sell this forever, but uh, when it finally did sell, I looked inside and saw that it started desilvering, so I have to get that restored. There's a place in the UK that'll restore uh, prisms and resilver them, so it only costs thirty dollars which is a really good deal, so I'll have to get that done pretty soon. Uh, but aside from that, the viewfinder is pretty bright. Uh, it's not the brightest viewfinder, but it's got plenty of focusing snap, and the illumination is pretty even. Uh, compared to the Hasselblad uh, viewfinder, uh, this one is actually, I think, a little bit brighter, like half a stop brighter. And it has a similar amount of focusing snap, I think. Uh, but um, this uh, focusing screen in the Hasselblad, it doesn't have a micro prism spot in the middle like the Pentax does, uh, which is nice and helpful. Uh, also, one thing I should add: um, the the frame the frame coverage is ninety percent here, but if you wanted a hundred percent, you could get the waist level finder. Um, which I, I plan on getting one of these days uh, because just sort of looking down at, at, into the ground glass is something I want to do sometimes when I'm doing portraits just because it sort of changes the uh, the feel of, of how you interact with subjects. They're less intimidated for some reason when you're looking down and they're not you know looking at your face all the time I guess. Uh, let's see. So, uh, uh, what else, what else, what else? Next, there's a shutter button right here, the shutter dial, shutter speed dial. And this is like really firm, crisp, super solid feeling. And it has a nice sound, crisp, firm, intense, like I said. Uh, this is one of the nicest feeling shutter speed dials ever. It's it might be a little bit better than even a Leica, just because it's just, you know, so precise feeling. 
it's like ridiculous there's like yeah there's no wiggle at all it's it's just super super nice and firm um let's see what else okay uh as for the lens okay the aperture rings they sort of vary between different uh versions of lenses uh, this is the 7528, which I got because the bokeh is smoother than the 10524, um, which is pretty harsh when you're wide open and focusing at middle distances. So if you're doing uh, like a full length portrait with the lens wide open, uh, it's going to be harsh in the background. But this, it's... um. It, has, it tends to be a little smoother, you know, noticeably smoother when uh, in the same similar situations. Uh, and, and, and in general, it's really smooth too. Uh, the focusing rings on Pentax uh, Takumars, of course, are really smooth and buttery. It's not as smooth as the uh, screw mount lenses, but they're really nice. I mean, Pentax just knows how to make a really nice and smooth uh, focusing ring. Uh, also has a little uh, depth of field preview switch, which is really smooth and it has a nice click to, when you press it down to return it to the, uh, the auto position. And uh, Aside from that, like it's the the lenses, of course, feel really nice. Mm. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, oh, the their switches on the sides. Uh, so this switch, uh, it's like uh, the lens release switch. Um, it's. Uh, pretty firm. Uh, it's, it's a nice position and it's not that hard for me to reach with my finger like that to take off the lens. Uh, it's a little, my, my hand's a little short to reach it all that comfortably so I have to press it against my chest to really, you know, put enough pressure on it. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. And a good click to it when you uh, turn the lens on. And let's see, I've never actually used uh, this um, FP sync or X sync uh, socket for flash, but if you had FP bulbs, you could uh, get sync from 125th of the second. And you know, uh, I think 500th of a second, but X-Sync, that's like a 30th of a second, which is a problem if you're doing fill flash outdoors, but it's fine if you're indoors in dim lights for, you know, using studio electronic flashes. Uh, on this side, it's the uh, mirror lockup button, so uh, the lever has to be advanced. And uh, you just do this, and then the mirror goes up. If I, uh, oh, if for some reason, if for some reason your battery dies uh, when you like trip the shutter, it'll sort of go on the, the middle uh, stopping point and it'll jam uh, the film advance in the shutter. So uh, you need to take out the, the battery uh, flip out the switch like that, uh, replace the battery, and then after that you have to push the little shutter reset button, which is really flush against, which, which is flush against the body. You just sort of uh, smush your fingernail in, into the little little button right here, and then it'll reset the shutter. Uh, next. Let's see. Uh, this is a film type switch, 
you need to use a quarter to turn it. It's really firm and smooth. And uh, to open the film door, there's this little latch here that you gotta reach in with your uh, fingernail. And uh, to pop out the the um, to pop out the film reel, you got that little switch too. It's really nice and sturdy. And let's see what else is there. What else is there? Um, oh, here's a battery check light. It's a nice round little button. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was uh, uh, I, w I wanted to make more uh, portrait kit recommended recommendations like I did for the Hasselblad. So uh, aside from this like wide normal that I use, I got several portrait lenses. Um, so this is the 150 uh, f2.8. Uh, these are really cheap these days. It's like $150 or something like that. Um, it's equivalent to a 75 millimeter. And this is really good for like three quarter length portraits. Uh, it can focus close enough to do that. But um, uh, I think, uh, I think it's like, not that well regarded as far as sharpness is concerned, but uh, it makes smooth bokeh and is good for portraits where uh, sharpness, super, super sharpness when it's wide open isn't as important. Uh, so I, rec I would recommend it. It's, uh, it's, one, it's older type, so it's sort of like uh, really uh, smooth for black and white. Uh, next, uh, there's the, uh, what was this, the 200 F4, and um, this is the later type with the really recessed front element. It's really light, like ridiculously light. It's, uh, um, much lighter than the, uh, the older version, which I saw at a camera show once. Uh, really smooth, extends a lot. <laughs> um, this one, uh, it focuses down to like, let me say, uh, of 1.5 meters. So that's uh, basically five feet. Um, this isn't this is enough to get uh, a head and shoulders portrait when in you're in vertical uh, orientation um, and if you want to get uh, closer to do uh, uh, like a, a tighter headshot you need to get uh, the, the extension tube number one so uh, you can just put that on and and then you can mount it to the lens. Uh, these are really cheap too, um, like $200 in really good condition. So uh, that's another easy one to recommend. And then uh, if you want to do something like a really tight head shot or a face shot, then uh, you can get a 300 millimeter lens so you don't distort the facial features. They have a 300 uh, uh, ED version. That's the newest one, but that's pretty expensive, like 800, maybe a thousand dollar lens. Uh, that focuses closer than the, the later, the late, the late non ED version. This one only goes down to like, let me check. Uh, yeah, this one goes down to five meters too, uh, which is like enough to do a three quarter length portrait. 
um, which is not that great. Uh, uh, if you want to get closer uh, to do like like a like a head and shoulders down to a, a, a face shot, uh, you need to get get uh, the focusing uh, extent. You need to get the extension tube number three, and that makes it uh, that makes the that makes the setup really unwieldy. So uh, it's makes it really 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 uh, front heavy. And um, where is the button? Where's the dot? Okay, it makes it really front heavy. Ugh. Did I get this on right? Yeah. Okay. Makes it really front heavy and kind of hard to handle and hold still and everything. So it's uh it's more like a tripod le uh, lens, I would say. <laughs> um, hey, 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 where's it's kind of dark in here? Uh, there it is. Is that it? No, that's not it. Right. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this is way too heavy and uh, unbalanced. So this is something you will want to put on a tripod. But uh, with this, you'll be able to get to like a like a pretty tighter head, uh, shoulder, uh, uh, sh uh, head and shoulder shot. And if you focus all the way down to the minimum focus, then you'll get like really close to the face. Um, uh, but for, you know, putting on a tripod, uh, you either need like a ridiculously strong, uh, tripod head that, that you can turn to the side uh, or you'll have to like uh, wait around and hunt for like a, the the Kirk uh, L bracket for the Pentax 67, so you can put on like that, and then just uh, keep the tripod head uh, uh, standing straight up, uh, which is a little bit more stable, I think, uh, than than turning over on its side. So. Uh, I think overall uh, the Pentax 67 is uh, a great uh, portrait camera, although this setup is kind of a, uh, a headache. Um, if I really had to change anything, it would just be that the eye relief is not that great. Um, I mean, the eye relief on the, the Hasselblad is not the best either. Uh, I have to move my eye around to see all the corners and edges and stuff like that. But uh, it's it's workable. And uh, anyway, so uh, as soon as I get more experience with all the the landscape and uh, ND grad filter stuff. I'll make another video about that. So anyway, so uh, if you have any questions, um, uh, just ask in the comments. Uh, if you have a Pentax 67, uh, you can tell people what uh, your experience has been too. Uh, and if you have any advice on landscape photography, uh, you can, you know, uh, you can help me out too. So, uh, uh, that's, that's basically it for now. And, uh, let's see, uh, I don't really have, oh, I forgot. If you haven't followed me on Instagram, you wouldn't know that I'm going to get a haircut, pretty drastic haircut. Uh, so I'm just, you know, shave it all off or something. Uh, so next week, don't be surprised if I have a super short haircut. So uh, anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching and hope you have a good week.